Okay, so this lecture is going to begin to start to dissect the first of the four paradigms that we discussed and talked about uh, in terms of Mar uh, Martinez' text, and it's about behaviorism. Now, he coined the theoretical framework as being the mind's architecture, and that's being as behaviorism has had an extremely large influence on psychology itself. For the most part, you can see how this course can be a component of behaviorism. You've taken courses previously that help discuss every aspect to what we'll be doing now. And through the associations you've developed, you've learned several tenets of behaviorism already, as well as cognition and other theoretical frameworks within our field of psychology. So this is going to really feel familiar and it's going to be through the repetition that you shall develop even more complex processes in terms of learning. So now we're going to take a look back to the foundation of our first paradigm, that being behaviorism. So why do we study behavior anyway? Let's take a look and decipher the definition of behaviorism. Martinez talks about how it's the study of learning in humans as well as animals, and it's the understanding through the analysis of behavior rather than the thoughts and feelings. So what is behavior? The simple response is it's the actions that we do, and that basically is the premise to the paradigm. The primary goal is scientific study. Research, though, is not going to always pertain to looking at groups or humans or, or animals, but rather we're going to be wanting to look more within the individual person or animal's behavior. So when we think about someone who considers themselves a true behaviorist, then we have to understand that this is a person that's going to stress that the behavioral evidence would be necessary when we're talking about psychological assumptions. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy looks at three different tenets of behaviorism. And understanding that the first one being that psychology is the science of behavior. The second one would be how psychology is not just the science of the inner mind as something other or different from behavior, but behavior can be described and explained without making an ultimate reference to mental events or to internal psychological processes. Those sources of behavior are external, which would be within the environment and not internal as if we're looking in the mind of our heads. So, <clears throat> in course, of course, the theory of development within psychology though is somehow those mental terms or concepts are gonna be deployed by describing or explaining behavior, then either in terms of concepts should we be eliminated or be replaced by behavioral terms, or they can and should be translated or paraphrased into some type of behavioral concept. So based on this definition, we kind of look at the advantages as well as disadvantages of behaviorism. We know that the scientific significance is the core to behaviorism. Working with those tangible items within the environment and how it enthrones one's response can be observed in which there is very little question in terms of the triggers or the associations and those responses or reactions from a person. However, we also know that there are some disadvantages that can be uh, that would be in its doctrine uh, more of action speaks louder than words because there's less credence given to our mental processes like thinking, problem solving, emotions, our belief systems, our values, and so forth. So as a refresher, let's discuss classical conditioning, okay? Here, you're aware that Ivan Pavlov, he's the one that we thank for our ability to understand learning through associations. 
It's because of his observations with dogs that we now have an understanding about how a stimulus can evoke a response within humans as well as in animals. But it can be deeper than that. <clears throat> Many times our clients are going to show behaviors um, which develop through those classic signs of classical conditioning. Social phobias, post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as other disorders are great examples of how a neutral stimulus can easily become a conditioned stimulus. So take a walk with me down memory lane as I review some of those key terms that are more likely etched in your brains already at this point. So of course, we start with classical conditioning or it's also been known to be called Pavlovian conditioning. And this is what we feel as a learning process that happens through associations, be any feature of the environment that would affect behavior. So the example being Pavlov's experiment with the food was a stimulus between the environment and a natural occurrence stimulus. Stimulus then is considered to be any type of feature within the environment that affects behavior. Pavlov's experiments food was the stimulus. In terms of response, now we're looking at how the behavior is elicited by the stimulus. That being salivation was a response. The unconditioned stimulus, this is that feature um, of the environment and how it causes a natural reflex action. That being like, think about when you go to the uh, optometrist and they're checking your eyes and they do that fun little puff of air, um, which will cause you to blink involuntarily. All right, now in terms of condition stimulus, this is a feature within the environment that'll have an effect through the associations with an unconditioned stimulus. Think now when we're talking about Pavlov's dog, how it learned to salivate at the sound of that bell. Then there's the conditioned response, that behavior that's elicited by the conditioned stimulus. Now the dog is going to salivate every time that bell rings. Of course, we have to look at extinction. And when we talk about extinction, we know that that's when the conditioned response begins to die out by the break of the association between the conditioned stimulus as well as the unconditioned stimulus. So in classical conditioning, this is going to happen when that conditioned stimulus is really no longer being paired with an unconditioned stimulus. So that bell, it was no longer being uh, rang uh, repeatedly in the presence of that food. So gradually the dog stopped salivating at the sound of the bell. However, we also know that there's what we call spontaneous recovery. And of course, that's talking about how there's a return of a conditioned stimulus. And it's going to be weak, of course, after a period of time following that extinction process. So when Pavlov waited a few days and then he tried to ring that bell once more, guess what? That dog salivated again. We have to also know what generalization is, and this is talking about how a stimulus that's going to be similar to a conditioned stimulus would also elicit a response. So if the dog is conditioned at the sound of the bell, it might later salivate again um, to something similar to that bell. Think about a doorbell or um, a whistle being blown. However, in the discovery of classical conditioning, we also must look at discrimination. And that, of course, is going to be the opposite of generalization. That ability of the subject to be able to tell the difference between two different types of stimuli. So eventually, the dog kind of learned the difference between the doorbell and that of the regular bell that was being used. So when the doorbell rings, the dog really doesn't salivate because it heard the doorbell it's going to wait for that other bell to ring to let it know that food's around the corner. <laughs> so when we think about classical conditioning, we have to wonder why was this important in the first place? It allowed us to learn about how that neutral stimulus evokes 
primitive type behaviors like fear as being a natural type of stimulus. All right. I know the fun key terms was just a joy to hear, but we're going to go ahead and move on. So now we're going to just talk briefly about how behavioralism developed uh, here in the U.S. Of course, we have to speak about John B. Watson. And if you haven't looked already, um, we do have a lab assignment in the discussion board uh, that has an article that's by Malone in which asks the question, can we really consider John B. Watson to be the founder of behavioralism? Of course, we know about Pavlov's, um, his introduction to classical conditioning. We also know and speak about, can speak about the work of Edward Thorndike. But it appeared that everybody really was pulled to Watson's work uh, and how that really propelled behavioralism uh, into what it became today. So, of course, you look at the lab assignment and you see for yourself whether or not you can consider him to be the founder. Uh, but when we took Introduction to Psychology, most instructors conveyed that to be the case. Watson demonstrated that psychology has to be considered to be a science and not just folklore or uh, those who don't believe in uh, psychoanalytic um, paradigm would suggest that it's more than an art. It is the science. But did his work really start this paradigm on the path that is taken today? When you're looking at Malone's article, it's going to attempt to explain how Watson becomes such a prominent force within this arena. Uh, the strong charismatic personality that he presented with, along with being at John Hopkins University, these were anecdotes to what might be considered John B. Watson's fame. I had the pleasure of knowing James Watson, uh, a nephew of John B. Watson, um, who it's been several years now and did a colloquial with him um, back in, I'll say, 2002. Like I said, it's been a lot of years. Uh, and I can only imagine upon reading this uh, article, he would say it's preposterous and that uh, Watson definitely was a behavioralist. James, he's a definite behavioralist. And the J's seem to run like Gambit because his cousin, which was John B's uh, son, is also named James. But anyway, uh, moving back into the discussion of the lecture, you gotta wonder about after reading the article, did Watson really push this paradigm uh, because he really felt that it was necessary to see psychology as a science? Or was it the fact that deep down inside, he wanted to be a, a physician rather than a psychologist? I look really forward to reading your thoughts on the discussion board, whether or not you feel he's the founder or not. But we do know that he did make a contribution that allowed behaviorism to forge ahead and become one of the stronger paradigms um, within psychology. So we know about little Albert and we learned how he paired loud sounds with uh, the rat and other furry animals in order for him to elicit a conditioned response of fear, okay? Uh, we know that because of that, it was generalized through generalization toward other animals. There's a, if you look on YouTube, you'll be able to find, there's an old silent film. Like, first I was going to include it in this lecture, 
And then I decided against it. I was like, you can go and look. And I know that you've heard the, um, about the experiment. But he demonstrated presenting little Albert first with a dog and a monkey. And then he presented the rat. He presented a rabbit. And then initially, little Albert took it in stride. He was curious. He, wanted to, he didn't mind touching them. But once paired with the loud sounds, then little Albert, of course, became fearful of not just the rat, but of any animal with fur. Um, and that's that generalization that we discuss. Uh, even there's in that clip, it demonstrates Watson putting on a Santa Claus mask that has the cotton f buzz all around, which looks furry. That even scares little Albert. So Watson was able to derive to arrive to the fact that human behavior is malleable. If presented with those type of associations, you can actually gear a person to uh, a conditioned response such as fear. Okay. We know that through presenting a neutral stimulus at the right time can elicit a behavioral response. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, our experiences have shaped our learning process. Classical conditioning and education have been able to allow us to understand how the external stimuli like textbooks, classrooms, role plays, and the like, not only will evoke a behavioral response, but it's gonna also evoke an emotional response. As we learn through associations, we also will associate different emotions along with our actions, as we've seen with Little Albert. Think about how you might have felt that the first time a challenging task was presented to you. Then think about how you felt when you were successful at completing the task. Now, many would consider operant conditioning as the catalyst in what I'm discussing. However, it was first through classical conditioning that you were able to make a connection. I think about when I was in grad school and I took my multicultural course and we were reading uh, Counseling the Culturally Diverse by David and Daryl Sue. Now, it wasn't called that back then and unfortunately, that was about eight, 10, was 20 years ago. So <laughs> I can't recall the exact name of the text then. It was the second edition that I was reading. And today, which it is called Counseling the Culturally Diverse, they're now in their eighth edition. And thankfully with a lot of changes. But at the time that I read the text, I can recall becoming quite angry at what I read. And I disagreed with almost everything the Sues wrote within that textbook. So, what does it have to do with our lecture? Well, Martinez discusses how classical conditioning helps us to be able to learn how to understand what we're feeling. Most behaviors, they might not see it this way, but we often produce what Watson had termed an emotional condition response toward the pairing of that neutral stimulus and the conditioned stimulus. So when I began to learn about the various racial identity models and started looking and delving more into why one would have stereotypes and why how those connections are built. I really didn't at that point think of it as being neutral stimulus, which it was, but it was, you know, my anger that helped to generate after completing the assignment, it I didn't see that as an emotional condition response. But it, what it did do having that pairing of the book to completing the work at hand, I learned more about how to begin to start channeling my emotional response to help me to broaden my understanding of diversity overall. And that was due to classical conditioning. So there is a big connection with conditioning and education. However, there are those limitations on being able to utilize classical conditioning as a sole component. No, it's not. But we have to see it as part of that process. Now, we all associate operant conditioning with Thorndike. 
but Thorndike he actually kind of viewed operant conditioning more as instrumental conditioning because in order for learning to occur we must be able to experience through trial and error and that was necessary for the learning process to happen according to Thorndike. So Thorndike's experiments pretty much we know is of the puzzle box looking to see whether or not the cat can ex can escape the box. So pretty much it involved him placing the hungry cat in the puzzle box and in order for the cat to free itself the cat had to be able to figure out how to be able to escape. Thorndike then documented the duration of time that it would take for the cats to free themselves in each experimental trial that was done. So at first cats they engage in ineffective ways to escape. Um, they would scratch, they would be digging at the sides or at the top of the box. However eventually through trial and error cats ultimately was successful by pushing or pulling the escape route. Now after each successful trial the cats will engage less and less within the ineffective escape behaviors and more quickly respond with the correct escape actions. So Thorndike was able to reserve to his observations as the law of effect. This is those responses that's closely followed by satisfaction that will become firmly attached to a situation thus more likely to be able to reoccur when the situation would be repeated. Conversely speaking, if that situation would be followed by like discomfort or dislike, then those connections are going to be weaker and that behavior response will be less likely to happen um, when, that act, when that particular situation is repeated. Now the strength of a response increases when it's immediately going to be followed by that satisfier or better known as a reinforcer. On the other hand we have to also look at the fact that these actions are going to be followed by unpleasant effects <clears throat> that are more likely to be weakened as time goes in. Thorndike's puzzle box experiments with the escaping box that's considered to be the satisfier. Every time a cat successfully escapes the box, then that behavior immediately preceded the uh, escape was going to be reinforced and strengthened. So we all know B.F. Skinner. He's really prominent in behavior <clears throat> when we talk about behaviorism. Okay. He identified two key types of behaviors in his theory on operant conditioning. The first being is the respondent behaviors. And those are simply being actions that's going to happen through our reflexes without having to learn anything. So pretty much say you put your hand on near the stove and it's hot, you're going to automatically withdraw your hand in response to that heat. Now the second type of behavior that Skinner uh, refers to is operant behaviors and this is defined by any and every type of voluntary behavior that's going to be acted upon through the environment in order to create the response. Now these are those voluntary behaviors that's under our conscious control. It's also those actions that can be learned so the consequences of our actions plays an extremely important role within our learning process. He talks about the way SSR, which would be in terms of stimulus response and reinforcer, is going to be it's different from that classical paradigm of just the stimulus and the response. It's through reinforcement that helps increase the likelihood that a behavior is going to actually happen um, or be repeated. Shaping is going to be done in terms of talking about successive approximations. That being our actions like me being the teacher uh, will help shape how you learn the material that I'm providing. So I might start off by telling you a definition 
then give you an example of how that is interacted in play. That will help to shape how you learn that material. So we know that teaching is a complex behavior and that it takes a lot of practice and a lot of work. It's where not everybody's natural at doing it. Believe it or not, once upon a time, I dreaded public speaking. I mean, literally dreaded public speaking to the point of almost having panic attacks when attempting to do it. And through behavioral modification, during my internship year, because my supervisors and the faculty at my internship site, they discovered just how bad it was for me uh, when I had to do uh, a presentation that uh, it was the intervention that was needed. And what they did was behavior modification in that I repeatedly, and when I mean repeatedly, on a weekly basis had to present. I didn't only have to present to the faculty in the psychology department, I had to present to the entire Mississippi State Hospital uh, family of staff, um, sometimes to patients. Uh, that didn't stop there. I also had to go out. I was sent on conferences to have to do uh, presentations there. I mentioned earlier on uh, talking about uh, Watson's nephew and, and doing a colloquial with him. Well, guess what? That was part of that year in which I was being transformed, as I would say, through behavior modification. So it's complex, but through that shaping and through that work of reinforcement of seeing that I was being listened to, getting you know, praise that the work that I was doing, it helped make it easier to the point of which I was strong enough to say, you know what, when I was told about a adjunct a position at Jackson State University back in 2004, I went ahead and jumped on it and the rest is history. So, as you can see, with through operant conditioning as well as classical conditioning, I was able to help get myself to the point I am now. Um, but we also have to look at the different type of reinforcement schedules. And as you can recall, we have that continuous reinforcement where it's every time, the same time, the same length, it's going to be, uh, the stimulus is going to be presented and the response is going to be expected and then we will provide a, a reinforcer to help increase the behavior to continue or to discontinue a behavior. Variable ratio reinforcement, as you know, is considered to be the strongest type of reinforcement available as it allows for anticipation. It allows for the person to continue to work toward it. That's why gamblers have difficult times letting go because it's that anticipation to be reinforced that would actually make it difficult for a person to stop. All right. So let's look and discuss the enduring impact that behaviorism have in terms of education, uh, uh, social philosophy, as well as parenting. And we, we understand that positive reinforcement is present throughout education. It so holds true when reinforcement can be withheld. When we earn an A on a paper, a, uh, or a test, for example, it propels you to be able to work harder so that you can repeat that feeling you got when you first got that A. When points are deducted from a paper, this too can serve as a motivator for you to be able to do better, particularly at the level of education where you are in terms of having to pay for the opportunity to learn. The use of a token economy is a great example of this and we see it with elementary schools in terms of K through 12. 
children's going to react positively when those stars are being handed out. And then when they're taken away doing because of inappropriate behaviors, the children's response will often be shown a decrease in that negative type of behaviors. Ultimately, these techniques help teachers to be able to shape how learning will occur for the student. The core component in this curriculum is what we have to focus on in terms of how reinforcement is throughout education. Similar techniques are going to be often utilized by parents. Those token economies, using praise, using punishments, these are those examples that's used that's going across in parallel with education. Parents can provide what I like to call that mental compensation when they provide that positive reinforcement. And then they also help a child be able to understand one's consequences to their actions when punishment is applied. This along with the school environment will help within that learning process. Now Martinez in the textbook, he noted how Skinner talked about patterns of reinforcement and punishment in terms of society and culture can collectively shift behavior for society. The effects, of course, is not always a good one. Uh, in terms of society being rewarded because of aggressive acts or punished altruistic uh, attributes, those counterproductive type of um, reinforcement schedules they exist. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't see these type of violent crimes in our society. Behavior in itself it can be including destructive type and inappropriate behaviors that fully explains those patterns of reinforcement and punishment that each of us would be able to experience um, and that we've noticed and seen demonstrated throughout history. When we look at operate, uh, operant condition theory, there's not really a, any other kind of explanation provided. It looks at determinism in terms of being able to remove blame, like for example, a criminal. They'll be talking about, you know, well, it needed to be done. This, in terms of how we look at our rewards, our consequences, and our actions, can be seen throughout everything we experience. There's going to be those times when we're challenged by actions of others that would reinforce a behavior that's not always a good one. Let's look at what's recently been occurring in terms of the, the death of the <clears throat> Mr. Floyd and how that was happening because of a police officer who overstepped bounds and didn't consider his actions. We've seen how that criminal behavior has been negatively reinforcing society. When that officer in question was arrested for his role in the man's death a week or so later, instead of it being a satisfier, what it actually did was ignite people to become more angry and start rioting, start doing, uh, burning, creating fires. Um, and we know that timing is an important factor in our ability to be successful in any form of condition, and that being classical or operant. It has to be immediate, it has to be consistent, which has not been demonstrated. And because of this, the impact that we know can occur is through reinforcement of negative or positive behaviors can definitely impact how a person will decide on how they will respond. So reinforcement is that consequence of behavior that's going to help increase the likelihood that that behavior will be repeated in the future. In defining reinforcement this way, it makes some sense because what counts as reinforcement for one person or an animal really wouldn't work for another person or an animal. But this is also a problem in terms of the definition. It's impossible to be able to test the idea that reinforcement is going to cause uh, a behavior to be repetitive or repeated. 
there's two entities involved, repeated behavior and then the reinforcement. And of course, these two are linked to the definition of behavior. So when we say behaviorism central declaration would be reinforcement, and that reinforcement leads to repetition of behavior, that can't really be something that's testable. It's not a conclusion, but instead it's an assumption. An assumption in which we can accommodate any evidence because it's not really dependent on the data. Science looks at the testability of assertions and the possibility that the propositions are going to be where it's invalid, um, can be disproved. Within the scientific method, we use our ideas and we'll look at uh, the data and we test the data over and over again to ensure that it's valid as well as reliable. The ideas can be vindicated or we can discard it. Science will help us to move on either way. The quality of reinforcement really doesn't meet the criteria there, and neither does the definition of punishment for that matter. Now, we have theorists that have debated utilizing animals in terms of uh, deciphering how humans would be able to respond to those same type of stimulus that's been uh, associated with animal uh, research. Tolman, for one, he suggested that the behavior of rats really doesn't explain fully how the behaviorist principles of stimulus and response happens. According to Tolman, propulsive behaviorism, which falls within the cognitive theory of learning actually, would postulate that behavioral acts have a goal or purpose that would select and guide the behavioral sequence until a goal or purpose would be attained. Propulsive, <clears throat> propulsive behaviorism actually incorporates gestalt concepts within field theory. In that contrast, behavioral learning theories altogether which would say to reduce behavior to smaller units of learned stimuli and responses. Now, Noam Chomsky, he's been one of behaviorism's most successful as well as damaging critics uh, in the field. He's been able to argue that behaviorist modes, um, models of language and learning cannot explain the facts about language acquisition, like rapid acquisition of um, young children in gaining language. And this is sometimes known as the phenomenon of lexical explosion, in which a child's linguistic abilities would appear to be more underdetermined by evidence of verbal behavior offered to the child in short periods in which he or she can express those abilities. So when the child hits the age four or five, then they definitely show limitless uh, capacity to be able to understand as well as produce the sentences which they never heard before. Chomsky also argued that it's plain untrue that language uh, learning depends on detailed types of reinforcement. A child does not, for example, uh, if they speak English uh, in the presence of a house would utter house repeatedly within the presence of reinforcing those elders. Language is, is learned without the sense of being explicitly taught or taught within great detail. And behaviorism really can't tell you how this would be so. Chomsky's speculations about the psychological reality underlining this uh, development includes a hypothesis that rules on the principles underlying linguistic behavior and that they are abstract. That being is applying to all human languages. It's innate and is part of our uh, native endowment psychologically as a human being. When we're looking at how grammatical sentences are structured or a person Chomsky has stated that there's virtually an infinite number of ways one might respond. And the only way in which to understand this would be to generate a capacity that would suppose a person possessed a powerful abstract uh, 
innate grammar, which underlines whatever type of competency he or she can have in one or more uh, natural languages. It's funny. Um, I have attempted to learn several languages and haven't been too successful, but I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, but there's a problem in which Chomsky referred to, which is talking about uh, behavioral competence and the performance that would kind of strip away or outstrip individual learning processes or their history of experiences that's more than just the issue of linguistic behavior that's found in young children. Apparently, there's a fundamental fact with us as humans in terms of our behavior and behavioral capacities that would actually surpass those limitations uh, within our reinforcement experience. History has shown that reinforcement is often too impoverished or determined uh, that's unique to how we would do it or uh, what we would do. And so much in that learning would be a required pre-existing or innate representation structure or principal type of constraints within that learning would occur. Now, <clears throat> last on the slide, we've talked about Albert Bandura and looking at social learning theory. Here, he postulated that classical and operant condition are both necessary. However, he also added two additional components that being the mediating processes that would happen between stimuli and responses, and then the behavior would be learned from the environment through the process of modeling or observation learning. Bandura talked about how modeling uh, helps to respond to different situations. And after you finish this lecture, I want you to watch, I included on this page, uh, Bandura's experiment with Bobo the uh, doll and pretty much is going to demonstrate how without direct reinforcement children do learn through imitating that's seen by others and actually we keep I keep going and saying children but the same holds true for anyone not just children so individuals that are observed they're considered to be models in our society, children are surrounded by many different types of models, that being of their parents, their teachers, family members. They can be looking at uh, characters on the television, um, within their group, peer groups. There's so many different areas. Brofenberg, um, Brofenberg, I'm sorry, speech impediment day, but Brett comes up to mind when we look at those different systems. However, these models will provide examples of behavior that's going to allow a child to observe and imitate. And it doesn't matter in terms of gender. It could be masculine or feminine. It's also where it can be pro or antisocial type behaviors. Children will pay attention to some of these people or models and then they take it in, they'll encode that behavior. Then they'll start to imitate or copy what they've seen um, or observe. And they do this regardless of whether or not the behavior would be gender appropriate or not, it doesn't matter, they're gonna still do it. And the number of processes that it takes, we're more likely for a child to reproduce the behavior um, that society would see as appropriate in terms of if, when we're looking at gender. So is there a downside to behaviorism? Intrinsic motivation is referring to that behavior in which we're driven by our internal rewards. In other words, I'm talking about how motivation will engage a behavior to come from us uh, as an individual because it's naturally desirable for you. Yet, what happens when the extrinsic rewards are provided? For an example, I love making dolls. I make what we call reborn dolls, or you might call it realistic looking dolls. 
And I first started doing this uh, because I love dolls. I grew up as a tomboy, played with G.I. Joe and fire trucks and train sets, and rarely played with the dolls like Barbie or such. But as I became older and became an adult, I fell in love with dolls. I started collecting dolls. And I got to the point where I was, my artistic creativity started wanting to say, I'd like to make a doll. Because I came across a reborn doll and saw it, fell in love. And I was like, wow, I think I can do this. And I got good at it um, to the point where people started buying my dolls. However, that initial intrinsic motivation, it started to weaken because of the extrinsic rewards of money. Now I only make a doll once in a blue moon because it no longer holds that same level of satisfaction it did when I was just doing it for the love of art. And that same thing can be seen in schools and it can be at home with parents when the intrinsic motivation would be undermined by those extrinsic rewards. What was a natural desire is now a less desirable thing for a person. So some learning strategies that hopefully would help uh, in terms of working with yourself or working with your clients when you, when you begin seeing clients and you're using behavioral strategies. That would be the first one is avoid associations of learning with negative emotions. When you are angry or it's something you do not like and we associate it with something else, we tend to avoid we tend to be fearful um, and thus in learning it, for example, I mentioned how I was trying to learn several languages uh, in my youth. Well, Spanish is one of those languages that I never, I couldn't even pick up anything of real substance, even though uh, within my family, um, my stepfather and some of my step siblings spoke fluent uh, Spanish. It prohibited me because I disliked my stepfather. Me and him always got into arguments and he always would try to force the language on me. That negative emotion I had actually became a block to the point I could never pick up the language. You wanna be able to try to learn using positive emotions. The more desirable you think something is or the happier you feel while the associations are current, the likelihood that that behavior will increase. And of course, I mentioned earlier talking about consistency. So you want to apply continuous type reinforcement when we're trying to learn new behaviors. As you want it repeating constantly, but you want to make it continuous. Um, cookie cutter, cutter approach doesn't work. You need to be able to individualize any type of treatment protocols or behavior, of behavior modification that you would use for the person that is before you. You're not going to want to be able to take a sheet and say, okay, I'm going to have them do this, this, and this for client A and then client B do the same thing because as mentioned earlier, what works for one does not necessarily work for the other. Be careful not to reinforce undesired behaviors. Um, you know, you've heard the term enabling. Think about a person um, who is dealing with a drug addiction and sometimes family members, they placate the inappropriate behaviors, which basically will reinforce those negative behaviors. You want to be able to reduce uh, reinforcement as that behavior becomes established. Don't make them dependent on that reinforcement. That's where that variable ratio we talked about earlier comes into play. Switch from to random reinforcement 
and that helps it the learning to become more robust and robust I'm saying more likely that the person is going to make the connection and repeat the actions more than they did if it was on a strict schedule Try not to undermine with using extrinsic rewards. It's okay to do sometimes, but you don't want to do it every time. Um, you want to be able to tap into that intrinsic motivation. Get that person to have a love for doing something for the satisfaction for themselves. And, and I'm quite sure you heard about how uh, when we talk about the workforce and talking about uh, having a job that it's not about how much you make that makes a person satisfied. We've had studies demonstrate and show how it's actually the satisfaction of the person doing the job well as well as being recognized in terms of positive reinforcement of praise rather than monetary values. We want to also be able to uh, use rewards that a person doesn't expect out of the blue it boosts and then of course using those cognitive concepts helping them to improve their thought processes helping to uh, eradicate any type of real rational thoughts that they would have would help in terms of how they learn so to wrap up chapter two realize that when we talk about learning and cognition the first paradigm behaviorism it spans wide in terms of how we as humans as well as how animals learn and that behaviorism has influenced aspects throughout one's existence in terms of psychology in terms of the education process, in terms of how parents raise their children. It's throughout, we can see it all over. Uh, we have to remember that teachers really do need to take hold and grasp these concepts to help with uh, teaching their children how to understand, not only children, but like me and you right now helping in terms of reasoning, understanding, as well as looking at how we would critically think about things. This can all be impacted through classical conditioning, operant conditioning. So with that, this is the end of chapter two. Feel free to send any questions that you may have or jot down comments for the next time we do get together uh, and have a live chat. On that note, I hope that everybody stays well and have a great day.